What's up, family? How y'all doing? I uh, just want to say, yeah, just recently got married. It's been a it's been a very very unique year. I know for many this is a very hard year, for, but for whatever reason, it's like some of the most monumental changes in my life. From uh, I actually proposed uh, about it was about three months ago, and so uh, I think there's a picture. Let's pop it up for you guys. But uh, proposed three months ago in Colorado. Um, she said yes, as he said. <laughs> Uh, and then wanted to get married in Colorado. And uh, funny thing is, it was in Estes Park. And so the difficulty, if you know anything about Estes Park, was, and it was last week, was there's some big fires going on. And so we're like, man, this is, are we going to need to switch? Are we going to need to move? And we we're having everyone stay at these cabins. So we we're freaking out. And uh, the irony is we were worried about fires, but the real thing that happened was there was snow. Um, and it was like, not a blizzard, but... Uh, there was a lot of snow on that day, which made for some great Pinterest photos uh, for a wedding. And it looks like we're really happy. I was so worried about my wife. Just I'm like, I don't know how y'all are doing it with dresses and that little fur thing you got on your shoulders. Um, but it ended up being really, really awesome. And uh, yeah, this is now our first official Sunday together. I guess, as Jeff said, I'm an expert on marriage. If you need any advice, I'll write a book. But um, just wanted to quickly say, and I want to pray, is... Uh, It really is an honor to be here at this church. Um, I get to travel across the world and especially across the country speaking to hundreds of churches. And um, I don't say this with, I mean, with 100% sincerity is I often say this is the most kingdom-minded church I know in America. Um, I I know y'all know, but I don't think everyone else knows how much you guys are intentional about things that really matter, I think, to the next generation. Um, I'm, it's a very unique mix. I'm a a Mexican South African. Um, My dad's, my mom's the youngest of 14 um, in a very large Mexican family, basically an army if it's that big. Um, and they're all from Kansas of all, all places to be. And then my dad's a six foot four um, African-American man, um, but he's, he's a white man. So I would say I'm technically, I'm whatever's convenient because I am technically African-American. He's just a white man from Africa. Um, I always say I'm whatever's convenient. Like if I apply for a scholarship, I'm always saying Mexican or African-American. If I'm, uh, if I'm trying to get I don't know. It's just a unique thing. But I'm actually, uh, as I say this, I think about like the diversity in this next generation. I don't know if y'all know, millennials, we always talk about them as the young people, but really Gen Z is the next generation. And last year, they surpassed this generation as the most diverse generation to ever live. Um, And I remember when I got saved, it was a whole new world as I realized how divided the church kind of is. And going back to you guys, I was like, man, this church what Jeff is doing, what the staff here is doing, what you as a congregation is doing, I get to see from the outside how much you guys are intentional about racial reconciliation in our city, bridge building in our city, being very involved in uh, what other churches are doing, which I just think is so kingdom-minded because when I got saved, um, I I was in a very diverse world. Then I became a Christian, and I realized, oh, the church isn't diverse. Um, I remember thinking, I was 16 years old, I remember thinking, man, bars and clubs are more diverse in the church. And for the next generation, that's very problematic. So to see what you guys are doing, uh, there's so many things that you guys are doing in the city that you don't put your name on. There's so many churches that are being helped that just no other church knows about. I remember asking Tim Keller, and I'll finish and pray, is uh, I asked him, why do you do so much for other churches when you're already busy yourself? Because the Lord knows you guys got a lot going on within your own church. And Tim said, I remember him saying, it was in New York, I asked him this, and he said, churches that only help themselves are similar to cells in the body that only help themselves. And he said, cells that only help themselves are actually called cancer. He said, so when churches only think about themselves, it's actually cancer. And he actually said, cancer, I mean, uh, cancer is when we don't go out and be missional and build community and uh, just intentional be about be intentional about unity and so i just want to thank y'all for what you guys do thank y'all for having me um as a young guy and if y'all will join me in prayer i just want to uh, share how do we really pursue this next generation if i can just with a show of hands even you at home how many of you guys have kids that are gen z or millennials raise your hand if you just have kids that are in high school or uh millennials would be post-college uh raise your hand high if you have kids how's that going for you guys pretty good uh, I just want to pray because I know a lot of y'all now are living with them or they're living with you. I know a lot of this generation, they're at home right now. And so you're like, 
hey, how do we reach this generation? How do I disciple this generation? So I just want to pray for you guys, and let's get started. God, thank you for just what you're doing here at Park Cities uh, Baptist Church, and just thank you for uh, just any opportunity to share on behalf of your generation. Uh, I pray that you give me the words. I pray that you guide me. What's the right thing to say? What's the right thing to share? And I just pray that uh, as much as the enemy is trying to divide us, would you please, Lord, uh, we need you to unite us as a body. Um, we can't do this without you. And just would you show up? Uh, me speaking without your spirit is uh, its only so good. It's uh, life-changing when you show up. And so we ask for your presence, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, like I said, many of y'all growing up, with this generation, uh, can I be the first to say that sometimes millennial and Gen Z can be difficult, like, and can be, I would even say punk sometime. It could, would anyone be honest enough to say, hey, sometimes this generation is hard? Anyone? I mean, just to give some freedom, I, I, I know some of y'all are like, well, you, I can't say that because you're young. One of my favorite verses, this maybe should be one of your favorite verses, because I'm a young person that I, for whatever reason, God saved me the first time I went to church by myself, like wanted to be there when I was 16. And two weeks later, I had an older man pull me aside and disciple me. His name's Kevin Batista. He actually lives in the city still today. And he started discipling me, started pouring into me, and he changed my life. But I also would say he messed me up because then I started thinking older and being wiser and started caring about things because he would just laugh at all my problems. And I'd be like, this is a big deal. Like, she broke up with me or this test is really hard. And he's like, dude, this is, you're going to make it. And I needed someone older in my life like that. Um, one of my favorite verses, and this should be yours, and you're not going to see this on a T-shirt. You're not going to see this on a coffee cup. But Matthew 17, 17, actually, it's not, it's not here. I'm just going to quote it for you guys. Is Jesus said in red letters, oh, how long will I have to put up with you people. <laughs> Jesus said that, red letter, and he was talking about the disciples. He said, Jesus is up, oh, how long will I have to put up with you people? And he says, you twisted and perverse generation. And so sometimes if you're frustrated with the next generation, just know you're in good company, like Jesus was too. But my hope with this is how do we bring us together? How do we build a bridge and how do we unite? And part of that is I get asked, probably the most common question I get asked all the time is, how do we reach this generation? What's some tips and tricks? What would you tell us to do? And so I want to tell you what that tip or what that trick is, the silver bullet to reaching the next generation. And this is it. It's not skinny jeans. Thank God. Um, it's not a really cool haircut. It's not tattoos. It's not you have to have the coolest worship band ever. It's not that you have to know all the cool songs. The number one tip and trick on how to reach the next generation is simply go and make disciples. That's it. Just simply Matthew 28, when Jesus says, Matthew 28, verse 18, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And he says, basically, uh, I'm going to read it for y'all, is all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, um, even to the end of the age. To me, y'all, we can try to think of all these tips and all these tricks on how to reach the next generation, but the reality is if I get to meet some of the most diverse, dynamic young leaders across the country, and what I say is as I meet these very mature, very talented, just unbelievable young leaders that are in their 20s that are making a huge difference in the world, the most common denominator among the most mature young Christian leaders I've ever met is that they always had someone older in their life that poured into them, that discipled them, that mentored them, that invested in them, that challenged them. I would even dare say that gambled on them. There's this common theme of someone older helped them. And so I would just tell you, if this is what Jesus said to do, he literally said, I mean, his last words should probably be our first priority. And he said, go and make disciples. This is what he said to do as his last words. This is what he did in his ministry. And then this is what I'm seeing even experientially in young people that are making a difference. Then I would just say, maybe we just got to get back to discipleship. I'd even go so far to say that I don't think we have a next-gen problem. I'm convinced that we have a discipleship problem. That this problem of we don't make disciples, because the common denominator also is, Barna did a research study and found that only 17% of Christians have a committed relationship to someone younger than them in the faith that has said, I want to pour into you. 
And as long as only 17% of us do what Jesus did, said to do, and is the common denominator among the most mature young people I know, then I'm convinced, again, maybe we don't have a next-gen problem. Maybe we have a discipleship problem. And my hope is let's talk about how can we fix that and what can we do about it. First part is I want to talk about what is discipleship and what is mentorship because I do think there is a difference. Um, for example, mentorship, is, I would say, is come and meet with me. It's if Jesus said to Peter, hey, come and meet with me. I want to go to Starbucks once a week for three years and I want to pour into you. Um, and mentorship is very powerful. It's very important. I've been mentored by certain individuals where it's changed and shifted the way I think about God and I see uh, faith and my identity. But I would say discipleship is more powerful. In some ways, it's more difficult. In some ways, it's uh, easier. But mentorship is come and meet with me. Discipleship is uh, come and follow me. That's to include someone in your world. Um, I'll be the first to say discipleship can be difficult in the COVID world when you're trying to invite someone into your life. Um, but there's this idea that discipleship is caught more than it's taught. Um, it's those moments when you're following someone. Um, I don't know if any of you guys go hunting or if any of you guys go. There's something about, like, uh, I heard this once. Uh, I'm living with a family. You guys might know this family, Ray and Denise Nixon. And um, they're, they're, they live in the, this area. And uh, we were shooting. I've never shot an animal. I just, I, I'm sure at some point I need to do that. But I, I have not yet done it. Um, and I've shot those clay things, um, they're like the, the, the Frisbees that go into the sky. Um, I've shot those things, and I love doing it. We were doing it a couple weeks ago, and um, I was just talking about how my, my wife's dad, I want to get to know him better, but I do connect sometimes face-to-face, -face, but I said I connect better with men when I'm doing something with them. Uh, there's this theory that women can connect face-to-face -face a lot better than guys. Like They can just meet, and they can just unravel and talk and be transparent while they say if women can connect face to face, I've heard it said that men connect shoulder to shoulder. It's going and walking and doing something together. Um, and so I was talking about, hey, let's can we go shoot these frisbees uh, with with it and bring your dad to it? I know they're not called frisbees. They're like, what are they called again? Clays. Or no, they're called they're called skeet, right? Or is, is that is that not? Don't trust. Clearly, don't trust me in this world. But in in discipleship, I know that. <laughs> so. Uh, all that to say is it's this idea of I'm following you. If you think about what Jesus did with the disciples, he didn't say, come and meet with me. He said, come and follow me. Um, now, here's the thing is I know for many, the idea of come and follow me is maybe intimidating or maybe uh, here's the reality is the number one excuse I've ever heard for why people don't disciple someone younger than them. Because um, you might be thinking, who could that be or how would I do that? Or honestly, the number one reason I hear is I'm way too busy. Like, I've got too much going on. Uh, in fact, it's funny that I'm preaching this after getting married, a week after getting married, because I used to always say this, and I know what I signed up for now in getting married is, I used to always, I talk to a lot of young singles, and I tell young singles, the, the most powerful thing that the older generation has and why the young people should pursue discipleship and pursue mentorship from the older generation is the most powerful thing they have is wisdom, is this wisdom that we need. I would even go so far to say, like, the enemy knows that we need that wisdom because what we have is this, I would say the most powerful and the most influential thing that, uh, that young people have is time. Uh, there's this window of time where you don't have to ask your parents for what to do when you want to go do something because you're out of uh, high school now. And you don't yet have to ask your wife what to do. I can just go do something. Like, but now if I want to make plans <laughs> going forward for the rest of my life, <laughs> so I have to ask my wife, hey, is that okay to me to go do that? Um, and I was like, you guys don't get it. Like when it talks about the gift of singleness, there is parts of it that is a gift. Now there's a beauty and a gift in marriage too. They call them golden handcuffs because then once you have kids, it's golden handcuffs. Like they're good, but it still is. You're, you're, you're committing to something. I always tell young singles, don't waste that time. And I would tell you guys also, don't don't let them waste that time. Like you might have to enter into the world like Jesus entered into the world and said, hey, let me pour into you. Let me, or come and follow me. Or um, It's really important. Now you might be thinking, but I'm too busy. Um, I, my, my brother, my middle brother, he has four kids and he's married. And I personally, y'all, I've never met a married person with a full-time job with a couple kids that's often thinking, man, what am I gonna do with all my free time today? Like, people that have jobs, that have kids, that are married, don't have time. And so that's just the reality. We're not going to get around that. And that's the beauty of discipleship 
as opposed to mentorship is mentorship is adding one more thing to your calendar. But discipleship is including someone in your calendar. That's a big difference is if you mentor someone, you're going to have to add a 6 a.m. meeting at QB's or some place in the morning. Uh, but if you disciple someone, it means you get to include someone into your world. I'll do a, a quick story. Is uh, Raymond Harris is another guy who lives kind of in this neighborhood a little bit. Um, and he's a man who's discipled me before. And I, even yeah, as, I, as we go, I want to show this real quick. Um, this even shows, this is the learning pyramid. It shows a little bit of what... Uh, this is, uh, they use this in school for like what impacts and what is the retention rate when you do certain methods. And as you guys can see, uh, lectures, which is kind of what I'm doing right here. This is, for some of y'all, uh, I think sometimes in the church we over glorify the gift of speaking. But the reality is speaking is good. But although we do this in America, we say, oh, if he's a really great Christian speaker, he's a great Christian leader. I would not say that's true. I would say disciple makers are the greatest the best Christian leaders, those who can go and do that. And I think anyone and everyone is uh, who can do that, and that's who God's called us to do. It's when we do this, 5% of the sermon is even remembered. Just this statistically is not remembered. But if you go down, you see discussion groups. That's uh, what Jesus kind of did with his group, practiced by doing. He allowed them to start doing and then taught them to teach others. That's true discipleship, and that's pouring into someone who pours into someone else. Uh, for example, I mean, this message... I, I hate to say it, but it's like, if I asked y'all what was preached three weeks ago, and I put you up here and say, hey, tell us the main three points, I think you'd be nervous. Because we just, we don't retain the message as much as we retain when you get to see someone live out the message. Um, I think any of you guys have moments when you followed someone you respected, saw them do something, and you made a mental note, I want to be like that one day. I want to do that one day. Uh, I would not be the man I am today if it weren't for men who lived a life that I got to follow and see and be like, man, I want to be a father like him one day. I want to be a husband like him one day, even though I didn't have kids and even though I wasn't married. And that's what this generation needs. I think for many of y'all, y'all might be like, man, this generation is difficult or just so distracted. We are. Like this generation without discipleship is like Lord of the Flies. Y'all know that book? I'm about to ruin it for you. This generation, P Piggy's going to die. At the end. And if you don't know, you had, that was like required reading in school and it literally came out decades ago. So I don't feel bad about ruining that, mo that book for you. But it's like, we are like seventh graders asking other seventh graders for dating advice. If we don't have married couples giving good advice, like you don't want to get advice from the guy. I'm like, when I get advice from some young guys, I'm like, don't you use Tinder? Like, I don't want advice from you. You don't know what you're talking about. I need someone who's been married for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Do you guys get what I'm saying? It's like we need you in order to be these, these things. If we don't have you in our life, if this generation doesn't have discipleship, we'll just look to our right, we'll look to our left, we'll see our own generation, and we'll think, oh, well, everyone else is doing this. Oh, well, this seems to be normal. It almost is like judges where we'll just say, well, we'll just do what is right in our own eyes. Is that not what's happening right now? We don't have a millennial and Gen Z problem. We have a discipleship problem. We have a generation that's doing life by themselves, and it's leading to foolishness, and it's leading to not knowing the things that God has done before him. And so um, here's, here's, I talked about what does it look like to be a hero a little bit. Um, even before I go into this, I, I want to pick this verse, this idea of like including. Um, in this verse, it uh, talks about, this is uh, Paul talking uh, to one of his disciples, 1 Thessalonians 2.8, and he says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. I think this is really important. It's like, I didn't just share the gospel with you, and I didn't just preach to you. I actually shared my life. I included you. Um, even an idea of where can you include people, a uh, couple, couple quick ideas. I would say um, some places I try to join is I try to join maybe your personal life. Uh, maybe it's your hobbies. Maybe it's the thing you like to do. And I'm not saying do this for every young person. I'm saying find one. I'm saying do for one what you wish you could do for this whole generation. But just find one young person and say, and I think God will highlight who that is and say, how can I find this one person? How can I include them? Maybe in your personal life. That's like your hobbies, the things you like to do. Uh, or it might be your family life. I can't tell you how powerful it is to include someone in your family life. It might be as soon and as simple as maybe there's some young person, the young single, that has family in another town or just does, comes from a broken family and isn't going to be with their family, that this week you invite someone young to Thanksgiving. 
like for me as a as a um, as a man who grew up without a Christian father and still doesn't have one, um, to have Kevin, the first man who discipled me, let me see his family and let me see what he was like with his wife and let me see what he was like with his kids, it was so impactful. It was so impactful. You, I think this idea is the two excuses we have is we don't have time or we don't feel equipped or we're not worthy or we're not good enough. Um, but the reality is we don't need you to be a preacher, a teacher, this like author. We just need to see what is a healthy spiritual life look like or a man or a woman that's even just trying to pursue God or what does a healthy family look like you come from a very you got a generation coming from a very broken divorced family it's like more than this generation has ever seen and Gen Z is only getting worse and seeing millennials marriages now you do not know how powerful it is just to be invited to a dinner table or to get invited to to go shopping for groceries or I can't tell you story after story I mean like one of the guys, Raymond Harris, I said, he, he let me run with them. So he includes me in his personal life. I will quickly say there's also your work life. That's really hard right now because of COVID, but maybe it's letting them do, maybe they want to do what you do. So it's like, let me show you how I do what I do. Let me show you a little bit of behind the scenes. So it's personal life, family life, work life, or church life. Maybe it's them joining you and serving here at the church. Um, but for Raymond, it was his just running. He likes to run. And I wanted to get discipled by Raymond Harris um, Crazy busy guy, took months just to get a meeting with him. So I told Raymond, um, I said, Raymond, I, said, I, I usually try to, by the way, I usually have to tr train young people to trick older people to disciple them. That's usually what I got to do. And I know people don't like being called older people. So I usually, I'll repeat that. I usually have to train young people to trick chronologically superior people <laughs> in how to disciple them. Um, and so for them, I always tell young people, Find out what they like to do in their personal life because that's the easiest place to get included because everyone that loves something wants other people to love that thing and just try to get into that. And so with Raymond, I was like, Raymond, I, re I text him. I said, I really love to start running. I didn't want to run. Who wants to, who wants to run? Like, no one wants to run. Like, it's, it's, where are you going? You're coming back to where you started. Like, it's, it's, it's no one wants to do this. Um, and... I, tri I, I tricked him. I did. I told him, I said, hey, I really want to get into running, and uh, I'm really serious about it. Can I, can I start doing that with you? And he texted me back, and Raymond said, if you're serious about it, then meet me tomorrow at 4. And I'm like, oh, man, why do these guys? It's like no one wants to do this, and no one wants to do it at this time. Like, it's like you guys are the, I mean, I respect that they can do it, but I wake up at 3.40, like, which is, feels wrong. Like to set your, your alarm at three anytime just feels wrong. Um, but I woke up, it's 3.40, I'm rushing to get as much minutes of sleep left. I mean, even to, yeah, it was just hard. I'm going to bed at 12, waking up at three. Um, and I get there and I love to say, man, this was the most powerful discipleship story I have to share. But the reality is Raymond did not even show up. And it's like downtown Dallas at 3.40 in the morning, not where I want to be at 3.40, and at his office. And the funny thing is, he didn't text me until about 7 a.m., which I had already gone home and gone back to sleep. And he texted me, and he said, I'm so sorry. I just read the text, and I could see, because I'm texting him like, hey, where are you? I'm still waiting out here. It's an hour. Okay, I'm going to go home. I'm sorry. I must have missed you. And he texts me, and he says, I'm so sorry. I, when I said 4, I meant 4 p.m., not 4 a.m., <laughs> And I'm like, why would you say, if you're so serious, come at four? Like, the funny thing is, I was so glad. I'm like, I'm so glad he knows that I would show up at 4 a.m. to get time with him. Because I'm not also saying that every young person is ready to get discipled. I would tell you, you need to look for a faithful, available, teachable, compatible, but especially hungry young leader. You need to find someone who's hungry enough to show up, keep their word, be there. But I do think each person, God's going to put a young person in their, in their path that is hungry enough to get discipled and get poured into and meet, and they desperately need it. I can't tell you that enough. My, if I was the Pope for a day, um, I would, I would, my mantra for the next generation and my mantra for the church would actually be this. Um, I came up with this all by myself. Um, I, would, I would come up with little hats, and on these hats, this would be my mantra just to get us to start prioritizing discipleship. And this hat would say, make the commission great again. If we could just simply, and I'm not trying to be political in any way. I'm just trying to say, I thought it was funny that if we could just make the commission great again, because it is a great commission, I just think sometimes 
why we're losing this cause-oriented generation is because the church isn't any longer doing its cause. I often ask, why is the most cause-oriented generation in the world right now not connecting to the most cause-oriented organization in the world right now? And I'm convinced it's because the most cause-oriented organization in the world right now, the church, who has the true cause that will change the world permanently, its people don't do what its founder did, which is go and make disciples. So if we could just make the commission great again, it would change the world. It would change the next generation. So what does that look like in real life? Um, here's a, another guy I want to share a story on him. Is His name's Scott Dudley. He is the pastor of uh, a Presbyterian church. It's called um, Bellevue Presbyterian Church in Seattle area. And I remember seeing this in his church. It's so funny, actually, that I'm telling this story because Brian Dunnigan, a pastor of Highland Park Presbyterian Church, I know a friend of me and Jeff, uh, texted me this morning when he saw I was coming here. And... Um, Basically, this man, if you see in that picture, there's four guys. You might not be able to see from the distance you're at, but I asked him, is this what I think it is? Because I knew this man discipled Brian Dunnigan, who's the pastor of Holland Park Presbyterian Church. He's a young pastor for a church that size. Um, and I knew that Brian would say he wouldn't be the man he is if it wasn't for this man discipling him when he was a college student and still to this day pouring into him. Um, and I asked him, Scott, who's the guy with the blue shirt, I said, is this the man who discipled you on the far left? And he smiled. He's like, it is. And I said, dude, don't tell me. Is that guy on the far right, is that who Brian disciples? And he's like, it is. I said, what was this? Like, what did you guys do? And he said, we had never all met each other. So we went on a retreat together just to connect and get to know each other. Because the older man had never met Brian, the guy who I discipled, who's now the pastor here. And he had definitely not met this high school kid who Brian discipled. And I thought to myself, that is what it looks like to be a faithful Christian. It, that is what it should be when you get it put on a pedestal is when you're a person who has a legacy of someone who discipled someone who discipled someone who discipled someone. Too often we make it, if you're a good author, you're a good speaker, you're a good leader, this is what Jesus did and this is Jesus, what Jesus said to do. And I'm thinking, what if we could all get to heaven and even have one or two of these guys or girls that we have poured into that would be what it looks like to be a hero. Um, and this is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. It's four uh, levels of discipleship. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, I entrust to, and faith, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You've, so it's like what you have heard from me, so that's two, entrust to faithful men who then can entrust to faithful men. That's four generations. And so um, you guys might think that is difficult, but we really do do that. Uh, if you guys see this on the side, this discipleship development rant, I want to quickly explain what this could look like. And maybe you need to analyze where are you in this because you're somewhere. You're in one of these places. Um, there's four levels here. There's learner, leader, disciple maker, multiplier. And see, a learner is someone who for years has known Christ, for years has been in church, and for years has been doing all these different things, maybe serving, but has never committed to a relationship to someone younger in the faith. And so that's when you become a leader is, Hey, I want to change that. I, I, it's crazy as how many Christians are in the church that have served, given, come every week, all the different things, but they have never actually gone to the action of, I'm going to do what Jesus said. I'm going to go and make disciples. I'm going to make the commission great again. And so you become a leader when you have someone fo younger following you, joining you, even if it's just pouring into them and mentoring them, meeting with them regularly. You become a disciple maker when you pour someone who pours in someone. And you might think, oh, but I am a leader already, even if I don't pour into someone. Uh, John Maxwell has this funny quote. He says, if you think you're a leader, but no one is following you, you're technically just taking a walk. So you might be influencing people, you might be impacting people, you're just not a leader technically because no one's following you. You're not making disciples. And I would say you're discipling someone once you pour into someone who's pouring into someone else, and you're a multiplier when you pour into someone who's pouring into someone who's pouring into someone. And that takes maybe a lifetime. That takes work. It takes time. Um, you know who does this really, really well? And I think this would help for us as a church to even analyze where are we in this is multi-level marketing people do this really well. People that sell knives, herbal life, all these different things. If you ever know, like they're very clear on the goals and the guidelines. And once you hear at this level, you get a pink Cadillac or like Mary Kay, all these different things. And it's helpful because then you know where you're going. It's not just show up, show up, show up, show up. It's actually go and make disciples. And you still gather, but you scatter and you pour into others. And you know, they'll be like, have these different levels, like your, your ruby, your diamond, your double diamond, your infinity stone, and it just keeps growing and growing in the goal. I think we should get back to this. And, and, and the funny thing is, I want to show an example where I see this again, is sometimes I think 
it's like this metamorphosis cycle where we just do the first part and we go to church. And it's kind of like, uh, if you guys know metamorphosis, it's there's a frog and we there's eggs, there's embryo, there's a tadpole, tadpole with two legs, tadpole with four legs. And I think sometimes we just get saved, the eggs, if you will, go to the next stage, embryo. We join a church and then the next stage we or become a tadpole. We might serve, we might join a small group and we just kind of stop there. And we're like, okay, that's what it looks like to be a Christian. And I think what can happen is we just stay a tadpole for years and years and years. And we never go and multiply and disciple someone who disciples someone and continue the process. And what's funny is they found a lake where tadpoles were actually getting stuck as tadpoles. Kind of like we can do here as a church is um, it was contaminated, it was polluted. And there were these tadpoles that were staying tadpoles, but they weren't staying normal small tadpoles because they were staying there for years at that stage. They were growing as big tadpoles. It's kind of a really cool look. Um, Here's a picture of one of them. Can you guys see it? Yeah, that's a tadpole. Um, And I know know we're at a Baptist church, so um, I I made a little edit right here. (laughs) Sorry about that, guys. Um, My point is this, y'all, is that we... We can get stuck as really, really big tadpoles, or we can grow into disciple makers. But we desperately need, as this generation, Lord's called us not to, to be, the Lord has called us to be fishers of men. He has not called us to be obese tadpoles. In this generation, we need you. I'll finish with one quick last story is um, one man who mentored me, his name was Chad Hennings. He's uh, played for the Dallas Cowboys. He told me this story that I'll never forget. And I just want to, again, remind you, Discipleship isn't something to be guilted into. It's in something I think you're missing out if you're not doing. Um, he told me a story about when he was a younger man who was, had little kids that were more like children, and he got a puppy. And he talked about how when he got this puppy, his kids were begging him to have a puppy. And when he got the puppy, the puppy reminded him. What, when he explained the puppy, it reminded me of young people. He said it, the puppy's passionate. He's jumping on everybody. Whenever the door opens, if you guys know what dogs are like, especially when they're puppies, like every time we open the door, He's trying to run out, and we had to chase him. And he said, whenever people came over, he always was barking at him, uh, trying to jump on him. And over the years, the puppy would simmer down, chill out, learn what to do. And he said, I remember the funny story was um, he talked about how the puppy eventually became old. And the puppy no longer was all passionate and jumping around and barking. He said, now the puppy was just chilling on his little bed, and he would just stay there. He said, even when people would come in the door... This little puppy who used to bark, and this little dog who's now an old dog, used to bark and try to jump on people. Now when someone come through the door, stranger, he would just like lift his head from his bed, kind of be like, what's up? And then he'd go back to sleep. And this old dog, apparently the kids were like, dad, can we please get another dog? This dog, 10 years old in human years, so old dog, is boring. He said, this dog's so boring. And I think sometimes young people think that of old Christians where they're like, this is kind of boring. Like you just want to come to this. Sleep here. The only, the only time the dog got up, he said, was to go to the bowl, eat some food, and then go sit back down. Until, because the kids started begging, can we please get another dog? This dog's boring. They got another puppy. And what's funny is this younger puppy would just bug the old puppy. He's like wanting to play with him, wanting to do stuff with him. But it, what's funny is the old dog all of a sudden started coming back to life and started doing stuff and going outdoors and showing him where the, the kennel was and where to get food. And this dog who was supposed to, the old dog was supposed to live only about a couple more months, the vet said, ended up living four to five more years, Chad told me. And he said, the old dog stayed alive longer, I swear, because that young dog would not let him die. It just wanted, and he brought new life out of that older dog. And, and I would tell you, there's a quote, and I'll finish this. He said, you may not be able to teach an old dog new tricks, but you can give an old dog a new puppy. And I would say through giving an old dog a new puppy, you can actually give an old dog a new purpose. Because the men and women that have poured into me and believed in me and mentored me have actually, I feel like, gotten life out of it as well. And so if you feel maybe a little bit bored or boring, maybe it's, hey, who has God called you in the next six months to start pouring into a little more intentionally, to invite into your world, to invite into your family, and I can't encourage you enough. We need you. I'm sorry that our generation sometimes is difficult, strays away, sometimes disobedient, but um, we aren't going to be the men and women that we need to be if we don't have you guys. And so I'm going to pray us out, and I'm just thankful to be able to share with you guys.
God, thank you for um, just all that God, you're doing through this church. Um, thank you for, yeah, just people that uh, get out of their comfort zone to invite others into their world to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. I pray for anyone who you're starting to challenge or nudge um, that maybe they should consider discipleship. I know the enemy quickly tries to remind us that we're not good enough, we're not worthy, no one wants to see what we're up to, we don't live a life that's grand enough, or we just feel that we have too much, uh, we're not godly enough even. I want to just, God, would you remind them that uh, Paul was an incredible Christ-like person, um, and that we're not trying to be like Paul, or trying to be like Apollo, or trying to be like Grant, trying to be like Jeff, um, that you said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so, God, just remind us that it's not on all of us, it's just that we would stumble towards you, move towards you, that we are spiritually a couple steps ahead of this generation. And if we could just guide them into what it looks like to look like you, to live like you, and to love like you. In Jesus' name I pray.